I'm going to recap verses 10 through 16. Was it 16? No, 18. And um, I'll just read those here to get us caught up. And, and because remember what I said last time, everybody knows John 3.16. I mean, people that aren't even believers know that verse. It's just out there all the time. Uh, but, but it starts with a four. It's like saying, because, and so how do, you, how do you know what's going on if you start a sentence with because? Because of what, right? So we, we need to have context behind this. And I think what you might understand from the verse alone, if you just pull it out of that context, of its proper context, you might assign all kinds of different things that you think it means. But it's really helpful to know that this verse was given Jesus spoke these words, it's red letter if you have one of those Bibles, uh, to Nicodemus when Nick came at night <laughs> to, to talk to him under the cover of darkness, snuck in there and um, wanted to know, hey, what's going on? Tell us some more because, you know, we, we, those of us in the Sanhedrin that are paying attention, know that you're from God. This has to be from God. You, nobody could do the stuff you do if it weren't from God. And then so Jesus schools him a little bit, tells him a few things and uh, challenges him that, you know, you're one of the teachers of, of God's people and you don't know these fundamental things that you don't understand. And, you know, he, he like takes him to task on it a little bit, but also challenges him. And, and like I said before, when I study this and I look at this, I kind of want to believe that, that I think Nicodemus became a believer after this and if not at this exact time later on he must have because he's paying that close attention early in jesus ministry you know give it three years and what's that going to make you think after that much time you're either going to harden your heart so bad that you're just one of the ones wanting to arrest him or you're becoming a believer yourself and we are told that many in the sanhedrin especially uh, of the party of the pharisees did come to believe in jesus so, you know, the early church was built on them. So anyway, uh, yeah, he says, you're Israel's teacher, and yet you do not understand these things. So this is the context that I'm reading here so that you'll understand verse 16 when we get to it, because you'll get what comes right after it and what led up to it, right? Jesus said to him, you, you're our Israel's teacher, and you do not understand these things. I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know. And we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the son of man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the son of man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only son. You see how many things are answered in this little passage of scripture right here? I mean, first of all, we, we have the way of salvation plainly, but right there. How is it? How is it that you can come to eternal life? Remember the bronze serpent on a pole was a weird thing that God told Moses to do because people were being bit by the snakes and dying of the poison that got in their, in their veins. But it was symbolic of a more important poison that's in all of our veins, sin. Uh, sin was in the human race and, and that viper bite was, was symbolic about, of you know, the serpent's bite in the, in the garden when uh, the devil appeared in the serpent and spoke to Eve and led her astray and she was deceived and Adam joined her, right? And the whole human race then has this, this coursing through our DNA, the sin nature, 
The sin nature was born into us at that time. And this was more important than getting bit by that snake and dying an earthly death because it's, a, it's an eternal death. And what he, Jesus said here is that you're, you're condemned already. You're dying. Dying, you shall die. That's actually what, what the Lord told Adam. Don't eat that fruit because when you eat that fruit, you know, dying, you shall die. In other words, it's a, it's a death that's going to lead to death. You, we're dying without him. Without being saved, we are dying. We're headed to hell. So the other thing that this answers is these people out there in the world that say, I don't know. I don't think I like God. I don't want to believe in him, trust him, because I don't like him. Because he's sending all these people to hell that are good people. Right? Well, that's just not the way it is. They're, they are already dying, and they shall die. In their state, they have not come to life in the Spirit. And only the Spirit can inherit the eternal life in heaven. So the Spirit has to come alive, and that's done by the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus taught Nicodemus about the being born again. You have to be born that second birth. Not a rebirth, but an additional birth. Your spirit has to come alive. And then he said, flesh gives birth to flesh. Your mama brought you into this world. You're living, but you're dying because your spirit is not alive. The spirit gives birth to spirit, the Holy Spirit that is. The spirit of God gives birth to our spirits. When? When we trust in him for that eternal life. When we trust his provision, which was his only son, that was his son, the son of man, but the son of God all in one. His death on the cross, that lamb of God provided the final sacrifice. He was no more sacrifice is accepted. He doesn't accept any more sacrifice for sin. The one was given. And in God's words, it'd be like, if you don't like that, then you've got a problem because that's the only one I'm accepting. I don't accept it, anything else. But if you'll trust in that, and trust in that sacrifice that I made for you, you'll have eternal life. Why? Because when you do that, the Holy Spirit of God quickens, brings to life your spirit, and now you have eternal life at that time. John told us later on in one of his epistles that I'm writing you these things so that you can know, you can be certain that you have eternal life. So if you're in Christ right now, you're a believer right now, you're already eternal. I mean, you're, you're going to live all, all eternally anyway. It's just whether it's going to be separated from God in an eternal death state and suffering because of the anguish in, in the soul because you know what you missed. And that's hell, right? Or you're going to accept that free gift and you won't have to die. You look up at the pole and it seems silly, but you look up at the serpent on the pole and you won't die of that snake bite. And that was symbolic. So the son of man must be lifted up just like the serpent was. You see the picture here that Jesus, Nicodemus knew full well the Nehushtan. That was what they called it in Hebrew, the, the serpent on the pole. And now our medical doctors have it in front of their offices all over the place, another variation of it. Uh, but it, it, it was, that's the Nehushtan. That's where that comes from. Uh, the serpent in the pole that looking to it, trusting God by looking to it, you're, you're healed of the poison that the snake gave you. And, and it was a miraculous thing because there was nothing physical to that at all. It was just totally a miracle, but it was a lesson. It was something people were supposed to see. This is symbolic of something greater. And now Jesus is telling Nicodemus, I'm that something greater. I have to be lifted up. And when I'm lifted up, and, and, and that was also a reference lifted up on a cross because he knew how he was going to die. He was going to be crucified in the Roman excruciating, excruciate, that word that we have that come, means out of the crucifixion, excruciate, right? Out of crucifixion. That's, that's where we get that word that's the, that kind of pain. So anyway, today, now we pick up at verse 19 and we'll finish up the rest of this chapter. I just wanted to really recap that because that's so fundamental to the Christian faith. You, got, you need to understand those things, but you can answer people's questions. Why is God sending everyone to hell? You know what? We're already going there. He's providing a lifeline. 
We don't have to go because he knows we're already going. It's not as though he's sending them. Yeah, it's his rule, but that's just the way it already is. And unless they accept him, his provision, they're already going to go there. So that's the answer to people that want to, you know, you could take them to this first part of John chapter three and read that to them and, and uh, explain that to them if they have that kind of an argument. So verse 19 now, um, we'll go to 19 uh, through 21. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds are evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. Okay, a lot to unpack here. But basically, you come into a dark room where there's a cockroach infestation, and you flip on the light switch, and you see them scurry, right? That's the picture I have of, you know, evil deeds, because those are little evil little things, right? And, um, and they're, they're horrible. They're awful, you know? But, but that's men's deeds, evil deeds, and they don't want to come into the light because it exposes them, and they've got to run and hide. So they won't come into this light because... The light of God, the light of Christ and everything exposes the soul to you. It's not like it's showing it to everyone else. It exposes it to you. And you really don't want to know that because you're happy in, knowing, in, in not knowing just how bad you are. Right? I once heard a guy say, how long has it been since you took a big whiff of your inner cesspool that is your own depravity? You know, uh, that's what we really are down deep inside. We know we're depraved people. We know that we're sinners. We don't even have to you know, convince us. Most of us really know. And for those that don't think they are, <laughs> we can just spend a little time going over the Ten Commandments and what they really mean. And, and, and you'll say, okay, all right, I'm a sinner. You know, why not admit it? It's, it's, you're, in, you're in the company with all the rest of us. All of mankind is sinners. There are none without sin. All have sinned, fall short of the glory of God. But God provided a way out, right? So anyway, he, he, this lesson that he's giving, the verdict, the, it's the reason for this judgment, basically, is what Jesus is telling Nick. The reason for man's condemnation is clear. The light has come into the world, but people prefer the dark. Jesus himself is that light. And those who preferred the darkness didn't accept him. They didn't want it that way. They didn't want to lose. There are lots of reasons they wouldn't accept him. But this is really the spiritual one behind it all. And um, Jesus said later in chapter 8, when we get there, he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will have life filled with light and will never live in the dark. See, so the, he says this later. It's, just, it's, it's a theme that he's reinforcing. That this is something that we were supposed to get, and it started back here in chapter 3. Anyway, so what he's revealing here was that works of obedience or disobedience were indicators of whether a person has been made alive by the Spirit. Do you have any works of obedience to God? You're still going to have works of disobedience as long as you're in this earthly tent and you have the sin nature still attached like a monkey in a backpack. You can't get rid of it. You can't shed it. It's there. It's always messing with you. You're going to have the moments of disobedience to God. But do you have obedience to God? Do you have things and times in your life when you are obeying God on purpose? You know that's what God wants you to do and you're doing it. That's a sign that you've come into the light, that you're in Christ, that you're in him and your, your spirit has been made alive. So that's just another one of those signs that you can know that you have eternal life. So the, the chickens come home to roost in this, really. Uh, until you look up to Jesus for salvation and believe in him, you're already spiritually dead and therefore can't even understand the heavenly things of God. Jesus, er, Jesus covered that with Nicodemus back in the early part of this chapter. He said, you can't even understand it unless you're alive spiritually. If your spirit's not alive, you can't understand the things. We don't expect people who are not 
believers in Christ to act like believers in Christ because they can't. They don't understand it. Stop trying to think they should because they can't. We're expecting something of someone that just doesn't know any difference and can't tell, can't do any different. Okay. So anyway, but if we just look it up to Jesus for our salvation from the venom of sin, he'll give us life through the spirit and we'll begin to develop spiritual eyes from that point on. They sometimes they come faster. Sometimes it takes a while and you got to work on it and, and it, and it, develops eventually but you develop those spiritual eyes and begin to understand the things of heaven and god's truth uh, because you're now alive in the kingdom you're already in the kingdom of god you're you're already then you know once you're uh, alive in the spirit and you're eternal you're in the kingdom of god whether you're still walking the earth or not you're already in his kingdom and part of one of his subject. Everyone's kind of his subject, but you're, you're now you're a willing citizen of heaven. That's why we have old songs like this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through, right? The angels beckon me through heaven's open door and I won't feel at home here anymore or something like that. I can't remember the exact words, but Something to that effect. All right, let's look at verses 22 to 24 now. After this, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them and baptized. Now John also was baptizing at Anon near Salim because there was plenty of water and people were constantly coming to be baptized. Now this was before John was put in prison little note there. Um, so now Jesus is preaching and baptizing. He's doing ministry now in the same way that John was doing, but in a different location. And um, John was baptizing at Anon. Why? Because there was plenty of water there. I mean, it makes sense, right? Uh, this, the, I, you got to pick up on some of these things. There's a lesson being taught just in that verse right there. Um, was it this big revelation or a dream or a vision from on high telling him to go to Anon? It was practicality, right? Do you need God to tell you to go to certain places? Or sometimes is that just the most practical thing to do? God orchestrated it. It's the same thing. God orchestrated it and made it that way. He wanted you to be at a certain place. So he made that the most practical thing for you to do. Because that's the best way to get you to mind. Right? Because if he told you to go there, you might get all, you know, defiant and rebellious about it. And I don't want to do that. You know, you ever do that? Are you ever rebellious? Is it just me? You know, uh, sometimes the practical reason is the way God gives us direction. Sometimes we try to look for God's leading for such simple things that, you know, I kind of think that God's maybe giggling at us sometimes over our struggle for looking for his direction because sometimes he just lays it out there and he, you just go with what he's laid before you and it's the most practical thing. So he's directing you that way. Uh, but we struggle so hard. Oh, you ever see people when they're really deep in, who are seeking God, right? I'm, I'm in prayer and, and your eyes are closed and your, your face is all grimace. Like you're just trying to, I'm seeking God, you know, relax a little bit. He's probably already, he's probably up there giggling right now. <laughs> Look at you. Yeah, aren't you cute? You know, I already laid it out for you. You'll figure it out, you know, right? I, I think God has fun like that. Hey, Gabriel, Michael, come and look at this. <laughs> Aren't they cute? You know, anyway. Uh, anyway, Chuck Smith tells this story of why he went to Costa Mesa. You know, he, Chuck Smith was the one that founded Calvary Chapels, Calvary Chapel Ministries. And his first church, he called it Calvary Chapel, and it was in Costa Mesa. And he, and he told this story. It, it wasn't the real estate there wasn't nearly as valuable as it is now obviously, or even by the time their church got up and running, it became a pretty valuable place there in Costa Mesa. The real estate values were crazy. Um, but prior to that, they really weren't. It wasn't about that. That wasn't why he went there. Um, 
And it wasn't because he had this vision and a dream. And he tells it this way. It wasn't like God gave me a big vision and a dream. You must go to Costa Mesa, my son. You know, it wasn't like that. It, he wanted to surf. And there was plenty of water there. Right? Yeah, I mean, it was that simple. The beaches were close by and he liked to surf. And that's why he moved to Costa Mesa and said, I'll start a church here. Right? And it was as simple as that. But God orchestrated, the, don't you think God orchestrated Chuck Smith? I mean, he founded Calvary Chapel Ministries out of that little move because of the surfing. You know, and all these surfers were the, the first ones to come and, and, and the, the whole Jesus people, uh, hippies and all that stuff too, came to his church because they were accepted. You didn't have to dress up. You could come in as you are. They even had the music sounded like the folk music of the day and hippies were up there leading the songs and they wrote new songs that were, you know, they could understand what they meant. Little choruses and stuff like Maranatha music came out of that. That's if you've heard of it, Maranatha Ministries, they all came out of that movement down there in Southern California. And do you think God orchestrated Chuck Smith moving to Costa Mesa without giving him a vision or speaking to him at night? He just put a desire in him to want to go surfing. And so he did. And he moved down from up north, uh, way north, like by Canada. He was way up there. And he moved down... Um, down there because he liked to surf and he wanted to go and live where he could do that every day. And that's, that's as simple as that. So I think we learned something from that kind of thing. And that's when he told the story, that's what he was trying to tell you. You know, it's pretty simple. There was plenty of water there. That's, that's why John was baptizing there. Jesus baptized wherever he wanted because, you know, he could make his own water, right? <laughs> anyway, uh, verses 25, 26 now. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you the other day, other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, well, he's baptizing and everyone's going to him. All right, well, so it's obvious here that these guys are jealous. The little arguments are, you know, and the ceremonial washing thing came out of that too. But um, the, the importance of the work and their ministry was kind of wrapped up in the number of people who attended their services, right? D does that sound familiar? Does it ring a familiar bell? Churches these days judge each other and the importance of their work and their worth by how many people attend. Nickels and noses is what we like to say sometimes in, in our pastoral gatherings. Yeah, everyone talking about the nickels and noses or what? You know, how big's your budget? <laughs> how many people you got these days? Oh, it's a good crowd. That's what I always say. It's a good crowd. Just leave it at that. I'm not, I'm, I'm not beholding to them to tell them how many are in our service. And, and in their, if we're going to get into some sort of match there, they're probably going to win. Most of them are bigger cities and everything else. So anyway, uh, they didn't even use his name. But they said that man who you pointed out. So let's see what John says. Verse 27 to 30 now. To this, John replied, a man can receive only what is given him from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Christ, but am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the groom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and it is now complete. He must become greater. I must become less. John understood what was going on because he knew who he was. He knew his role. You know, I like the phrase, stay in your lane, right? I've had to tell a lot of people that lately. Stay in your lane. You know, the, and I'm not just talking about when we're out on a motorcycle ride. Because <laughs> you've got to tell them then sometimes too. Stay in your lane. But, you know, what is it that's your job? And what does God have you doing? Stay in your lane. John understood what his role was in this whole thing. He was the one that went ahead of the Messiah. And he's telling them, that guy's, that you're saying, that man over there, he's Messiah. Don't you get it? That's the Christ. That's who he is. 
Go follow him. I have to decrease now. He knew that his time was probably near. I, I think God gives us some premonitions sometimes. He probably gave that to John. He gave him a lot of wisdom, that's for sure. A man can receive only what is given him from heaven. And that theme we'll hear throughout the Gospel of John here. Jesus said, you can only come to me if the Father calls you. So just think about that. Did you come to Jesus? Right? You're a Christian. You believe in him. You have your faith in him. God called you to that. Doesn't that feel good? God called me. He called me to that. Or I wouldn't have. Unless he called you, you wouldn't respond. You have a free will. He gives you the free will. But he has to draw you or your nature wouldn't allow you to. So he puts a little extra something in there to give you the ability. Now, there are, so, there are those that he has called and they say no. Unfortunately, that's, you know, predestination doesn't mean absolute. They have a destiny that, that God has destined them for, but they can refuse it and say no. And in disobedience, run from God, basically. Now, eventually, he's going to catch up to them. <laughs> you know, just hopefully it's before they end this life. You know, but from this point on, um, you're, you're going to see um, that theme kind of coming up a lot in here. And so this, this kind of, I think this is a model for Christianity, actually. From the moment Christ arrives in your life, from that moment on, and He takes up resonance in your heart, He has to be ever increasing as we decrease. Like the me, mine, my self-will will decrease and His will be done. Eventually, we could come to a point in life probably not completely because we still have that monkey in the backpack, but eventually we can come to more of a place where his will is the only thing we want to do. And you might say, well, I'm already there. I've made that decision. I want to do his will, but your old nature is getting in the way a lot, doesn't it? And it just will. That's until we shed this cloak when we shed this nature, this, this sinful body that we were born into, and we take on the new one, when we're regenerated, that's all gone. Then you have no more sin nature anymore from that point on. You won't have that thing dragging you down. Your desire of wanting God's will will just, no problem. It's going to happen. And, and it'll be totally fulfilled. And that, I think, is one of the things that's part of the, the great hope for us Christians. We hope for salvation from hell, right? But we also hope for salvation from that sin nature. We've been saved from the penalty of sin. We're daily being saved from the power sin would have over us because now we, we, we can say no to it. We have the Spirit alive. But someday we'll be saved the third time part of our salvation will be saved from the very presence of sin. It won't even be something that you have to even worry about anymore. And I think that's our big hope. And that's, that's a big deal, don't you? Verse 31 to 33 now. The one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. The one who comes from heaven is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. The man who has accepted it has certified that God is truthful. Okay, so what we have here is, this is right on the tail of John saying, I, I must decrease. Um, the one from above this is going back to the beginning of this gospel, the eternal existence of the Word who became flesh, you know, the, the Word who was with God and was God, and everything was created by Him and through Him and for Him, and then He came into the world, the, the Word became flesh, 
and dwelled among us, right? That's the first 14 verses of this, this gospel. Tell this, that one, he is the one who is from above. That's what is the reference here. Uh, he comes from heaven. He's above everyone else. That means you and me. He's greater than we are. And I don't think that is any problem to convince people of that, right? Jesus is better than me, right? That's no problem admitting to that. So uh, when Jesus preaches by the river, he is testifying to the things he has seen in heaven or from heaven. He's not just earthly things that we know about. He's testifying about heavenly things, eternal things. These are the kind of things you can learn from him because he came from heaven. You're not going to get that from someone from earth. See, yeah, I could teach you all I wanted to try to teach you, but I can't really teach you about the things from heaven. The only way I can is His words, and I have His word, and I teach His word. And that's why it's best if we stay in our lane, right? And use His word to, as what we teach, and not just a bunch of opinions. Sure, I'll give my opinion all the time, right? We, we can't help that. That's called commentary. <laughs> and I have my commentary written in all of these notes all the time. But it's his word that, that I'm commenting on. And, and that's where we receive heavenly truths, heavenly knowledge, things that come from heaven. Verses 34 and 36 now, the end of this chapter. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For God gives him the spirit without limit. The father loves the son and has placed everything in his hands. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. See, God's wrath is already on you. That's why you're headed to hell. Every human is on the highway to hell, right? Headed there, but God throws out a lifeline. If you'll grab a hold of it, you don't have to go there. It's our, our way out. So um, the Spirit doesn't put a limit on Jesus because why? He's the divine Son of God. He's a human man at this point, but He also is God the Word, the expression of God. He's God. That's why He could later say, the Father and I are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Because he is the representation of the Father. He's that, that second person of the Trinity that makes God known to us. God's logo. That's why we get that word, the, the, the logos. And that's why, what it, actually, if you read this, this book right here, John, in Greek, remember that first verse, in the beginning was the logos. That's what it says for word. We translate that in English to word. But they put a capital W on it because it was a name for a being, a person. All right, so anyway, Father loves the Son, put Him in charge of everything. Jesus is the ruler of all creation, and we'd better learn to listen to what He says and obey His commands. Uh, once again, um, verse 36, we have a promise of eternal life if we receive and believe. Just receive that free gift, believe, trust in him. That's all we're told we have to do to receive that eternal life. People like to put a whole bunch of stuff on it. Well, you got to do this and you got to do that. And, and on, oh, and did you go forward at an altar call? You don't have to do that. There's no altar call ever in the Bible. That's just something that in the Western Christianity, we invented that. We made that up. It was never in the Bible. You don't have to wait for Billy Graham to say, won't you come? Right? Because, first of all, he's not with us anymore. He's in heaven with the Lord already. But, you know, the Holy Spirit is going to speak to you. God's word will speak to you. That's Jesus, right? Through his word, he will speak to you that way. And the spirit will, will speak to you in your spirit and say, won't you come? Right? And he beckons you or calls you to believe. Okay, I believe. Well, then that's it. You're saved. What did I do to what, what all did I have to do to earn it? Nothing. I just have to take it. 
receive it. Now, if I don't believe, I guess that is the one thing that I have to do. It's the one thing that I have to do in this equation is to believe it, that it's true. Might be hard to believe, especially if you grew up in a legalistic way of thinking. You got to do this. You got to do this. You can never do this. You can never do that. If you ever do these things, oh, you're a sinner. You know what? You're already a sinner. You got kids? You ever, you ever raise kids? You know they're sinners. A bunch of little dirty sinners. All the time. Oh, they're horrible. Horrible sinners. And they prove it to us on a daily basis. Then they grow up and they're in their 30s and they still prove it to us. And then we look in the mirror. Dirty, rotten sinner. You ever looked in the mirror and told yourself that? I have. You're a dirty, rotten sinner. I tell myself that fairly often. And take a, st- take a whiff of that stench of that inner cesspool, the depravity inside. I know that uh, knowing I'm a sinful man makes me wow at his majesty of how unsinful he is and perfect. And, and it, it, that's where worship comes in. That's, that's how we worship. Acknowledging that and inside realizing that fact. That's the end of chapter three. We'll hit chapter four next week, hopefully, right? God willing and the creek don't rise. All right, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the things that you teach us through it and how, um, how enlightening just a half a chapter can be like this. We thank you for teaching us, teaching us the things of heaven that only the one from heaven could come down and share with us and teach us. And then we can explain it, but we had to learn it from you. We thank you, Lord, for that, for that sacrifice. We thank you for our salvation. Uh, We look forward to that third part, that eternal salvation from the presence of sin. But until then, we'll just be happy living in the first two tenses of our salvation until that time when you take us home. So Lord, while we're still here, we ask for your blessings. We ask for your guidance. We acknowledge the fact that you're guiding us even when we don't realize it. And we look forward to seeing what you're going to do in us and through us and for us. And all these things we pray through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And everybody said, Amen. Y'all be good now, you hear?